to, to be here in this very exciting meeting in this uh, environment. Um, okay, I will. Okay, I I I will try to uh, discuss. Uh, um, so, my, of course, I, I will try to discuss black holes, but. Uh, the way I uh, will structure my talk is, the, in the first uh, half, I will will have some fun, in the sense that uh, just I will put together. Actually, it's, uh, it resonates with uh, the, the the approach of Gerard, uh, that I will put together the things that are well known. I mean, common uh, common knowledge. Okay, and um, it's really interesting how far we can go by putting different well known things together. Okay, in uh, uh, creating some puzzles and understanding things about black holes. Okay, and then in the second part, I'll put some uh, hypothetical ideas. Okay, this is the list of uh, some of the collaborators and different uh, on different papers. It also, will be complementary to Roberto's talk in some sense. Okay, I will use uh, uh, units in which uh, speed of light is one, but I, I will keep sometimes, uh, actually most of the time, h-bar explicit. Now with the <coughs> h-bar and the g-newton, as you know very well, we can define a, uh, a length scale in, in gravity, the so-called <coughs> Planck length, and, cor and corresponding Planck mass, okay? Now what are black holes? So I, I will try to discuss most of the time the, the black. So my main, main interest is to discuss black holes from the point of view of a uh, of a uh, quantum physicist. But uh, I, will, I will try to put together the two different perspectives: the classical and quantum. Now, classically, every object has an associated gravitational radius, okay, which is twice g newton times the mass or Schwarzschild radius, um, and. Uh, the, the, the physical meaning is that if we contract a, an object beyond this point, we form, form a black hole. Okay, escape velocity becomes uh, speed of light, etc. Now, classically, there are se several uh, extremely well understood things about black holes. Um, and I will, the most fascinating ones are that concern information about black holes, how black holes handle and process information. Now, the, uh, so this, uh, there are series of, there, there, there are well-known theorems that we sometimes do, it goes under the name of uh, no hair theorems. And basically these theorems tell, tell us that black holes are featureless, classically, okay? Uh, now, ordinary objects, they have features, right? They have colors, shapes, and everything, okay? But black holes, they have very few quantum numbers, actually three, mass, uh, angular momentum, and, and charge. If we disregard these two, then just the mass, and nothing else, no other features, okay? So this means that classically they have no memory where they come from, because if I take any object and collapse it into a black hole, this black hole will be identical to any other uh, black hole coming from a very different initial state with completely different characteristics, right? Okay, this is fine, very nice, and this, is this fact is understood extremely rigorously, we know this. Now, what does this mean from the point of information? The po from the point of information, it means that the, since black holes are featureless, you would say that they carry zero information, right? Because I cannot send you a message using a black hole. When I send you a message, I always write this, the message in features. I need to, when I write a message on a piece of paper, uh, because I can rearrange features. Okay. Now, with a black hole, I cannot send you a message. Maybe I can send you one bit, yes or no. If you get a black hole, it's yes. If you get it, then it's no, because it's featureless. Well, there is some caveat, which I, I will come back later. So you would say that classically, black holes carry zero information. Yeah, you have a question? You mean, you mean a black hole, a black hole? No, right, because it, it goes away. That's the thing. Yeah, stationary. I mean, I, I can send you a black hole, okay? I mean, all the, the, the you, about uh, quasi-normal modes. Yeah, yeah, but they go away. So that's the point. So the stationary black hole, if I put a black hole, so if I wait long enough, then the black, the, all the information is erased. Then you can perturb it, of course, once you get it. But that will not be a message from me. OK? Well, 
Well, okay, I mean, yeah, exponential. We can come back to this, but actually, it's no, you cannot read it. Okay, the statement is that classically, I cannot send you a message. It's, it's a zero message that you can read it. So, any message that you can read will not come from a black hole, but will come from some excitation around it. For instance, I can, I can take a planet and put it around the black hole and send you the planet and the black hole. Of course, there will be information in the planet, but, okay. So, therefore, classically, you would say the black holes carry zero information. Now, the, the point is that the quantum theory tells us an extremely different story. And again, he, in this part of the talk, I'm not, assume, I'm not making any new, uh, new hypothesis or anything like that. I'm just putting together things that we know. Now, the quantum theory, first of all, it comes with h-bar, of course. And h-bar is the measure that tells us how classical is a given object. Okay, so when we take Big, obje big macroscopic objects, they are classical because their action is much bigger than h-bar. So it's a measure of classicality. Now the classical theory is when h-bar is zero or when action is infinite. Now then we have uncertainty principle, right? Of course, we, we, we know this very well. But uncertainty principle immediately tells us that there is no free lunch for information storage. Now, why? Because, for instance, if I give you a box of certain size lambda, and I can tell you, uh, store in this box some amount of information, let's say a single bit. You can put a single bit using a photon, for instance. You can put a photon in the box, but this will cost you energy. This will cost you energy at least h bar divided by the size of the box. Okay? Now, this is a, there is a huge difference from cl classical story, because classically I can send you an arbitrary amount of information essentially for free, for, for zero energy. Because I can make an electromagnetic pulse, classical electromagnetic pulse, with infinite number of features, and can send you, and the electromagnetic pulse, pulse can cause arbitrary small energy. But this is not true in quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics, we immediately we have to pay price for energy storage. So, since energy gravitates, this means that now, in quantum mechanics, when we take quantum mechanics and put on top of it gravity, we get something really, uh, really very interesting and fascinating. Because quantum mechanics tells us that to store information, we need energy, and gravity tells us that energy gravitates. So information gravitates. So if I give you a box and tell you, okay, put the information, more information put in this box, heavier the box becomes, and more it gravitates. Okay? This is a simple fact of nature, but it's really extremely, the consequences are extremely profound. Now, what are the consequences? Immediately you have two consequences, very important ones. First, well, first you realize that once you put together uh, quantum mechanics and uh, gravity, you immediately have a shortest wavelength, of, uh, shortest length scale of nature, beyond which you cannot go unless you violate energy conditions. Why? This is famous Planck length, right? 10 to the minus 33 centimeter. Why? Because suppose you want to go beyond Planck length, okay? So I give you a Planck length uh, pixel of the Planck length size, and I tell you, okay, measure something inside, okay? Let's say I, I, you want to measure go to distances, lambda, much smaller than the Planck length. What happens? Well, you have to do experiments. Of course, you will need a very powerful microscope. You, have, you need a very big accelerator. You have to accelerate photons or particles. You have to boost them up to transplankian energies. That's fine, that you can do. But the problem is that this, this photon should carry high energy and be localized in a very short scale, which means that you have to increase center of mass energy, not just boost. Not the type of boost that uh, Gerard was discussing in his talk, but center of mass energy, a momentum transfer. You cannot probe short distances without having high momentum transfer processes, okay? But then what will happen is that the, the gravitational radius of this photon will exceed the size of a pixel. So you are no longer have a photon. You thought you had a photon, and actually you have a black hole which is macroscopic. So basically, put it shortly, what happens is that the most powerful microscope can have Planck scale resolution unless you violate energy conditions. If you increase resolution, your microscope will collapse into black hole. And this is the bound which is extremely uh, strong, okay? It's a, it's a barrier that we cannot uh, bypass 
unless you violate energy conditions. Of course, if you have, for instance, particles with uh, negative mass, then you can say, oh, I can take particle negative mass, particle positive mass, and I can have zero energy and, and localize it to arbitrary short uh, distances. Okay, so now, another consequence is that there is a bound to the information storage. Because if I give you a box, and I tell you, okay, so here's the box of certain size, and store in this box as much as information as, as possible, right? So you can do it very softly, okay? You can put soft particles in the box, but because box has a finite size, you cannot put particles softer than the inverse size of the box, okay? And because of this, there is a bound to how much information you can store in a box of given size, and that bound is saturated by a black hole. That's famous Bekenstein bound. So the black hole saturates the bound on information storage. Okay? And the, the, the expression is uh, uh, area in Planck units, as we know very well. Uh, and um, this, uh, this inspires some certain thinking, one that uh, Toft uh, called the holographic principle, um, because it looks like if you want to do bookkeeping, okay, forget about, you don't know what is the physics responsible for it, but suppose you want to do bookkeeping, how black hole stores information. It looks like as if you, the, the black hole surface is divided in uh, Planck's uh, size pixels, and every pixel houses a degree of freedom, yes or no, okay? You have a little creature with a flag up or down, okay? That's the way the black hole looks like, that's the way black hole stores information, okay? That's why it's called holographic. Now, here you get a puzzle, because now you say, okay, very good, I have this Bekenstein bound on entropy, uh, on information and entropy of a black hole, let me see what happens with it in classical limit, okay? So what is classical limit? I have to take h bar to zero. In classical limit, I take h bar to zero, Planck scale goes to zero. So the information carried by a classical black hole is infinite. But I told you two minutes ago that the black holes were featureless. And correspondingly, information carried by the black hole, you would think that it's zero. So how can you reconcile zero and infinity? This is a puzzle. Now, this is the puzzle that you see. We got it without assuming anything new. This is, again, literally textbook physics, right? You put together what you know classically and what you know quantum mechanically, and you get a puzzle. Now, puzzles are fantastic in physics because we progress by solving puzzles. Without puzzles, we would never progress, right? So now, solving this puzzle will give us some very interesting information about how black holes store information, okay? Now, suppose you tell this to some uh, quantum computer person, okay? This, this person has no idea about black holes, doesn't even care, okay? For him or her, this black hole is just simply a device to store information, okay? Period. So, the person knows quantum mechanics, that's it. Now, then, if I'm a quantum mechanical person and I only care about information, black hole for me is a sequence, it's a message. It's a sequence of zeros and ones, as any other message, okay? So there's a sequence of zeros and one, and long sequence. And if I want to translate it as a, in, in language of quantum information storage, of course I have to understand it in terms of some qubits. Now, quantum information is stored in qubits. Qubits are two level systems, zero or one. You can have more levels, but it only changes things logarithmically, so it's not important. And so you have n qubits, and they can be in two, 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 two states, each of them, and then you have two to n possibilities, and you have this so-called two to n quantum microstates of a black hole. Okay? Perfect, very nice. Now, however, every cu qubit in nature, it doesn't matter whether this qubit comes from a black hole or from your laboratory or from your computer, has several characteristics. One of them is the energy levels, level split level between the two energies of, a, of the qubit, because qubit can be in two states, and then there is a there is an energy splitting, a, energy difference. Okay, so energy between zero and zero and one. And here comes the puzzle about the black hole. Not not the puzzle, but really very something very exciting because. 
for normal systems, what is the level splitting between qubits? Well, if I, if you gi I give you a box of uh, size R, okay, the normal system that you could do in laboratory, this computer, whatever, the level splitting between qubits is given by the inverse size of the system, okay? Right? You cannot make it, no, no, you can normally you cannot make it cheaper, right? Um, just by quantum mechanics. However, the, 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 the level splitting for a black hole, from what we just said before, is ridiculously small. Is delta E, the qubit levels, is one over n times this. Now, it's, this is a fantastic, fantastically fine splitting. Now, to give you an example, okay? Compare, for instance, a one centimeter box in which you want to store one, cube, one bit of information, one qubit, for instance, uh, a one centimeter computer, okay? Uh, this will cost you approximately energy of 10 to the minus four electron volts. Now, one centimeter black hole, that will be black hole of Earth mass, if you want to dial one qubit there, cost 10 to the minus 70 electron volts. Okay, there is an enormous gain in information storage in a black hole. Now, this is really fascinating because this is something that you, we cannot undo because whatever I told you just right now is completely independent. What is your favorite theory, microscopic theory of a black hole, okay? Uh, whatever it is, this theory has to deliver capacity of the system to store information so cheaply, period, okay? Now, the point is, we don't know what it is. So the question is, what is physics behind this? How black hole manages to be so smart to sort of seemingly almost violate laws of quantum mechanics? Now, okay, here comes some ideas. Now, the question is, we, cannot, we don't know how to answer this question, of course, because, well, but we can try to ask the following question. Now, it, maybe this is the part of some general phenomena of nature, okay? Maybe black holes are not unique. So question is, can we understand this part of information storage in terms of some general phenomena of nature? And they actually, it turns out that the answer is yes. There are systems in nature which have this property. I'm not claiming that those systems and black holes, they operate in the same way that we don't know yet, right? But this is really intriguing. So the systems that have this property, it turns out, are systems of cold bosons, okay, multi-boson states, at the quantum critical point. Now, think, think about the following thought experiment, okay? Uh, I give you a box, and I tell you, okay, imaginary box of certain size, lambda, and I'll tell you, okay, put in this box as many gravitons, or some, some other particles, but let's say gravitons. Let's say we are in pure gravity. Put there as many gravitons as you can until you form a black hole, okay? No problem, you can put gravitons. Now, gravitons, they interact extremely weakly, okay? So the interaction strength alpha, I, I denote it by alpha just to compare with electromagnetic interaction. Interaction strength alpha between two gravitons is L Planck divided by, the, by, the, by, the, by their wavelength, by the De, Bro De Broglie wavelength of momentum transfer. So for normal size gravitons, like macroscopic, macroscopic ones, this is ridiculously small. So if you put two gravitons in the box, they don't see each other, okay? If you put more, they still don't see each other. But if you put many, at some point they may start seeing each other because of the collective effect, okay? This is what Roberto was mentioning yesterday. Now, it turns out that something very interesting happens when the number of gravitons times their interaction strength becomes one. So in other words, this is a transition point when gravitons start seeing each other, okay? And after that, they can form a, a, a loose bound state. By the way, this is not only true for gravitons, this is also true for cold atoms. Actually, that's why this is exciting. Um, so this is a universal phenomenon of nature. If you have attractive bosons, the gas of attractive bosons, with certain weak coupling, okay, there is, they try, it, ter it, it turns out that there is always a universal phase transition, quantum phase transition, when the coupling strength and the number, they compensate each other. 
So there is a, uh, so in this room, let's say, okay, to imagine many bosons, they don't see each other in the first case. Then they see each other and collapse. Now, what happens after, this is system dependent. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested right at the transition point. And it turns out that this property is universal. So when you have system which is around alpha n one, then this system delivers the qubits which are very black hole type in the sense that they are suppressed by one over n, okay? So, and this is the property also in the systems in laboratory. You can do it in laboratory. You can put cold atoms in the, in, the, in the box, cool them down, bring to the critical point, and you see that near the critical point, the, the qubits that they deliver become one over n cheaper than what you, what you would naively think, okay? Now, this is very interesting because, uh, by the way, you can do this, uh, okay, here are some plots by my students, uh, Alex Pretzel et al. You can do this kind of, now, what is interesting is the following, that this uh, property is exhibited by simplest systems, okay? For instance, you can take one dimensional gas of cold atoms on a ring. Now, by the way, that system is exactly solvable, okay, so there are no questions asked. It's such a stupid, simple system, okay, which you naively would think this has nothing to do with black holes, exhibits the same pattern of information storage as black holes do. I'm not claiming that black holes are cold atoms or necessarily are cold bosons or whatever, but the similarity is really striking, okay? So you see here, this is an exact solution of the exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian, which you can do. Now, also notice what is happening at the phase transition. This is one particle entanglement entropy. Now, this should ring a bell again, right? Because for this system, the, tr the entropy increase is extremely sharp around, the, and this is the transition point. Also, what is striking is how fast the n uh, sets in. Because n n normally, I would think that for n, n equals 10, the system should still be, I mean, pretty much behave like a normal quantum mechanical system with, no, you see, already for n equals 10, the transition is extre extremely sharp. Now, for 2000, this is like a vertical line. Now, again, you see, this is very striking. This is very black hole feature of an increase, a normal increase of an entropy, okay, for the system. Now, okay, from here, so until here, there was no speculation. I just gave you facts, okay? There are facts of nature, that there are systems of nature that they, which exhibit this quantum criticality, which store information in a way which is strikingly similar to a black hole. I'm talking only about information storage part, physics that is responsible for information storage, okay? Now, okay, now we can make this hypothesis. This sort of cries for it to make a hypothesis because uh, let's make a hypothesis that black holes the, the behave in a certain similar way. In other words, black holes are multi-graviton states or multi-particle, multi-graviton states at quantum critical point, okay? Again, this is not, uh, this is, um, we have a basis for this hypothesis because as I told you, this is a, a fact that the point where you form a black hole is precisely a point where alpha n is one. If you simply ask this question, forget about quantum critical anything, how many gravitons I should put in a box so that they become a, a black hole in completely, by a completely conventional computation, you will see that alpha n must be one, okay? The number of gravitons should be such that their, their number should be, uh, the, their interaction should be uh, compensated, okay? Now, anyway, so now the point is the following, right? that uh, now we understand what is happening, that why there is, why zero and infinity can be reconciled. Now in, in physics, as you know, it's very hard to reconcile two, two finite numbers, two with five, but, uh, okay, this is the, <laughs> um, but the, the two, two, two finite, uh, very dramatic, so. <laughs> so, the, 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 so now the thing is that, it's very hard to reconcile two finite numbers, but um, zero and infinity you can reconcile. Now, what is the story? The story is the following. So it is true because, I mean, miracles do not happen in physics, right? Uh, the no hair theorems of black hole, no hair theorems, they are correct, absolutely correct. It's true that classically black holes are featureless. Um, it is also true that quantum mechanically, they carry Bekenstein entropy, and therefore when I take limit, a classical limit, 
the information of a black hole becomes infinite. So classical black holes, they do carry infinite information and they do carry infinite entropy. But because of the size of qubit, because of the energy gap of qubit collapses to zero, it would take you infinite time to, re to read this information, okay? So that's how zero and, zero and infinity are reconciled. So classical black hole core carries infinite amount of information, but because it's, 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 it's uh, written in zero energy difference qubits, you need infinite time to read it, okay? So there is no paradox. Now, this, okay, this can make you think that we are on the right track <coughs> because you can now try to understand whether this multi-particle picture of a quantum picture of a black hole also reproduces things that we know about black holes. For instance, Hawking evaporation, okay? In this language, of course, Hawking evaporation is a quantum process of depletion. You have multi-particle state n, and this goes to n minus one. And actually, you can see that with standard, absolutely standard textbook quantum gravity computation, you can reproduce to the leading order the Hawking evaporation in this system, okay? As a depletion rate. Now, okay, this is very, very exciting. Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, this thing that there, we found analog systems in nature that behave from the point of information storage like black holes uh, is exciting on its own because first we can, with this, we can try to understand properties of these systems in laboratories. Actually, we are talking to our experimental friends to, 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 to simulate the systems in laboratory. And uh, um, secondly, these systems are so interesting that Frankly, it's not so important whether real, they really reproduce black holes or not. They are very interesting per se, because they, they have the same properties that black holes have. Uh, this is already very interesting from the information point of view. Now, finally, uh, do, do, how, how much time do I have? Do I have three minutes? Ah, okay, great. So finally, there is one another uh, consistency check of this, okay? Um, so it is... Co what happened here? Mm. Yeah. So it is commonly accepted that at, at high energy scattering, uh, we, we produce black holes. So the end result of uh, very high energy scattering and, and, and end result are, are, is a black hole production. Um, so so this, uh, we, we even predicted uh, production of these black holes at LHC for uh, extra-dimensional theories and theories with low-scale quantum gravity. But in any case, I mean, I'm, I'm now talking in standard Einstein theory. The, the, this fact is, uh, is independent in which theory work. Um, so there is, this, there, there is this fact, but the point is that the process of black hole production, what is the S-matrix process that is responsible for this, has never been calculated because people were looking for scatterings of it, mostly two by two, two in two scattering, okay? Why? Because in order to understand black hole formation in an S-matrix language, you need some model, microscopic model of a black hole. You should have in mind something, right? What are you looking for? Which process? Two gravitons into what, right? Um, now, the, a, a, enormous work has been done in, the, in two to two scattering, in particular by Gabriele Veneziano and his collaborators. This was initiated by Toft. Uh, in 87, this, this, this first idea. Now the thing is that we can check consistency of this idea, okay? That if black holes have to do something with multi-graviton states, then you can tell me, okay, I mean, you have this hypothesis, black holes are multi-graviton states, now you can go ahead and compute. Compute scattering of two particles, of two very hard quanta, boosted particles, two boosted particles, into N final state part and see what, what you get because this should then you in this way you should be able to reproduce black hole production okay for example black hole production cross section and so on and surprisingly this this uh, probably is not so surprising why this computation has never been done until un, until recently because uh, yeah because probably there was no motivation but the thing is that okay, we did we did this computation. Uh, by the way, this is an alternate transparency. Then there was a next step by Andazzi, Veneziano, uh, and uh, Bianchi. Uh, a very nice computation. Uh, the, the 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 infrared dressing of this. Uh, so 
So we just took two gravitons, scattering of two gravitons into N, okay? In a fully quantum, fully qu quantum gravity computation. We did it in two ways. We did it in quantum field theory, and we did it in string theory, okay? Uh, so you don't have to know anything about black hole. This is like, forget about black holes. You are looking for two gravitons going into N, and see what you get, okay? Um, now, what is incredible is that you get precisely the entropy factor for the number of gravitons which would obey quantum criticality, okay? Now, of course you can say this is a coincidence, but to me it's a little bit too much to be a coincidence because how can an S-matrix process know, which is naively you would say, okay, this is just an S-matrix process, to know about black hole entropy. But this is a fact, okay? So you precisely get what you would get if N gravitons were forming a given microstate of a black hole, okay? Uh, as I said, we did this computation in both, in both languages, in quantum gravity and string theory, and the answer is the same in large N. By the way, this also shows you that string theory uh, in low energy limit, in the large N limit, reproduces quantum gravity. Okay, now, this computation we did in a domain, I want to make it very clear, we used textbook quantum gravity. We didn't invent anything. We used textbook string theory and textbook quantum gravity, okay? We did computation in the domain which we can control. Of course, there is a domain which we cannot control and we are not going there, but this we can control. And the answer, we know what it, uh, the answer is reliable. And th this is really striking. Now, this tells me, okay, this is a picture of black hole production at LHC, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so this, this, this makes me think the following, that first, uh, this way the, the black holes store information, and also the way black holes are produced in high energy scattering processes. This tells you that first black holes, if you want to understand black holes as quantum mechanical devices for information storage, of course, you may say that this is impossible. That could be. You can say black holes are something out of this world. You can never understand with them with standard quantum mechanics, standard quantum field theory. That's, not, that's a separate story, okay? I, but what I'm saying is that if we are able to understand black holes as normal quantum mechanical devices for information storage, okay, and normal states that you can get in S-matrix scattering, then there is a huge evidence that black holes have to do something with multi-particle state at near critical point, okay? Now, of course, details may be different. I don't know, because there could be some, some, some features that were missing and stuff, but I believe that this general nature of a black hole being a multi-soft particle state is, uh, should be, it really has something to do with reality. So let me finish here.